Hello awesome staff of the Northwest Kidney Center. As usual, I would like to begin with an update regarding applications to work at the Kent dialysis unit. Uh, needless to say, the response from the dialysis community has been overwhelming, although we still have an opening for an evening shift nurse. If you have been waiting for your chance to become part of the famous Kent Northwest Kidney Center staff, wait no longer. We have assembled the finest team of dialysis providers in the history of the profession, and I'd like to offer a small illustration about how great they are. Uh, as many of you know, two of our dialysis patients suffered a cardiac arrest within the past month, one at the hospital and the other one in our parking lot. Today's in-service is a nod to Jesse and the other staff members who were instrumental in resuscitating one of the patients outside of our clinic. And while the patient ultimately didn't survive at the hospital, he was successfully resuscitated by our staff in the parking lot. And our awesome staff uh, at least gave him a chance at survival. And that ultimately sums up our job and what we do at the Kent Northwest Kidney Center. We help our patients have a chance at life, whether it is for a few months or several years. We are in the business of extending the lives of people with kidney failure so they can spend more time with their families and doing activities they love. As some of you may know, I majored in history in college, and so I love history, and I'd like to begin by giving a little history on the Seine River in France. Seine River is an important commercial waterway within the Paris Basin in the north of France. It's 483 miles long and eventually connects to the English Channel. It has great historic significance. The Romans built its first bridge in 1 AD and it's still in place. It's very important for water trade in the Middle Ages. The Paris Code of Arms makes reference to shipping on the Seine. In 1821, Napoleon requested on his deathbed to be buried on the banks of the Seine River, although the request was denied. Uh, and the Eiffel Tower is located along the left bank, and it was an important target of the Allied operation in 1944. But the Seine River in France also has a dark side. It's a river in which Javert, the protagonist in Victor Hugo's 1862 novel Les Miserables, drowned himself. It's been a popular site for both suicides and the disposal of bodies of murder victims. In 2007, 55 bodies were retrieved from its waters. In 2008, the body of supermodel Katusha Nian was found there. And in 2019, four bodies were pulled out of the water in January alone. This is a picture of the Seine River in the 1800s. In the 1880s, the body of a young woman, estimated to be 16 years old, was pulled out of the Seine River in Paris. Suicide was suspected as the body showed no signs of violence. After she was pulled out of the Seine, she was transported to the Paris mortuary and put on public display alongside the bodies of other unknown dead for the purpose of identification. It was considered a grisly parade of nameless corpses, which was a popular diversion in its day. There is not a single window in Paris that attracts more onlookers than this, a contemporary account explains. No one claimed the body, but her beauty was not unnoticed. In fact, the pathologist was so taken by her beauty that he made an impression of her face out of wax plaster, a so-called death mask. He showed it to his friends and she became known as the Le Cune de la Seine, the unknown of the Seine. In the subsequent years, numerous copies of the death mask were produced. They became a fashionable fixture of Parisian Bohemian society. Albert Camus, the author, compared her smile to that of Mona Lisa. The face was said to have inspired many literary works and a generation of young German women modeled their looks after her, and yet there was no definitive identification. Stories were generated about the woman who had drowned. While possibly apocryphal, one story described two sisters who were identical twins who had been born in Liverpool circa 1870. One of them embarked on a love affair with a rich suitor and eloped to Paris, never to be seen again. Many years later, the other sister visited Paris on holiday 
and she was shocked to see while walking down the street the mask hanging outside of a workshop. She instantly recognized the girl as her long lost twin, frozen in time. But the story did not end there. In the 1950s, Asmund Lerdahl, a toy maker in Norway, saved his son from near drowning. In 1958, he and another man, Peter Safar, who was an anesthesiologist, pioneered CPR and used the face of the Lacun de la Seine as a model for the first aid mannequin, Recessa Annie. In 1960, Recessa Annie was first used in CPR courses. Since then, hundreds of millions of people worldwide have used Recessa Annie and kissed her mouth. Therefore, the Lacun de la Seine has been called the kissed face of all time. So thanks again to Jesse and the other NKC staff and Ken for successfully performing CPR on our dialysis patient again earlier this month. And with that as background, I would like to present an in-service today on cardiac arrest or so-called sudden cardiac death in dialysis patients. The objectives include reviewing the epidemiology of sudden cardiac death in the dialysis population, discussing risk factors for sudden cardiac death, and finally reviewing treatment and prevention options. Let's begin discussing the epidemiology of sudden cardiac death in dialysis patients. As we all know, dialysis patients are at extraordinarily high risk for death. Annual mortality rate has been 20% per year. How has that changed over the past 30 years? Unfortunately, despite all of the advancements in medicine and medical technology over the past 30 years, the annual mortality of a dialysis patient has barely changed. Sudden cardiac death constitutes about 58% of all the cardiac deaths in peritoneal dialysis patients and 25% of all cause mortality, and about 64% of all cardiac deaths among hemodialysis patients and about 27% of all cause mortality. The incidence of sudden cardiac death is 30 times greater in the dialysis population than in the general population, so this is a huge problem which warrants further investigation. This pie chart is adapted from the United States Renal Data System 2015 Annual Data Report and demonstrates visually that sudden cardiac death accounts for about 30% of all of the deaths of dialysis patients in this country. So what are the clinical manifestations of sudden cardiac death? Usually none. Usually there is no preceding warning system, but if they occur, uh, they're usually nonspecific. Things such as chest pain, palpitations, shortness of breath, or weakness. So what is the mechanism of sudden cardiac death in dialysis patients? Well, we know that sudden cardiac death is generally precipitated by an arrhythmia or an abnormal heart rhythm, but there are several different types of abnormal heart rhythms. To answer that question, Becker published a study in 2001 looking at cases of sudden cardiac death in King County dialysis units at the Northwest Kidney Center. He identified 47 episodes of sudden cardiac death and reported that 62% of the patients had either ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia as the initially measured arrhythmia in dialysis patients. These results were substantiated in a second study, this time published by Davis in 2008, also a retrospective study of sudden cardiac death in King County Dialysis Units or the Northwest Kidney Center between 1990 and 2004. They looked at 102 cardiac arrests around the time of dialysis, 10 before, 72 during, and 20 after. And they found again, about 70% of cases, um, the initial measured arrhythmia was ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. So why is the risk of ventricular tachycardia and fibrillation so high in dialysis patients? To answer that question, we have to look at risk factors for sudden cardiac death in dialysis patients. In the general population, the number one risk factor for sudden cardiac death is systolic heart failure. So if the heart doesn't pump well enough, say someone has had lots of heart attacks in the past, uh, then they are at increased risk for cardiac death. Second most common risk factor is coronary artery disease, hypertension, diabetes, older age, sedentary lifestyle, obesity, high cholesterol, and smoking status. In the dialysis population, however, the risk factors turn out to be different. Many of the risk factors are 
not associated with increased risk of sudden cardiac death in this population. For example, uh, patients who are obese, dialysis patients who are obese, actually have a reduced uh, risk of sudden cardiac death. High cholesterol does not predict sudden cardiac death. Not even a smoking history is associated with the risk of sudden cardiac death. In 2002, there was a randomized controlled trial called the HEMO study, which was published looking at the influence of the type of dialyzer and also the intensity of the dialysis prescription. And some of these patients died of sudden cardiac death. And so the authors were able to tease out some of the risk factors that appeared to be associated with dying of sudden cardiac death. And they included the following, the presence of coronary artery disease, left ventricular hypertrophy or increase in size of the left ventricular muscle. We'll talk about that. The long weekend in between dialysis treatments, how the dialysis is performed, particularly the type of potassium bath it's used, how quickly fluid is moved, the dialysis duration, the length of time on dialysis, or so-called dialysis vintage, the presence of low muscle mass, and finally medications. So most dialysis patients who die of sudden cardiac death have underlying coronary disease. Heart disease or coronary disease is much more common among dialysis patients. In the general population, coronary disease is present in about 12% of people uh, compared to 40% of people who start dialysis. Similarly, about 20% of the general population have swelling of the left ventricle compared to 75% of dialysis patients. Only 5% of the general population is thought to have congestive heart failure compared to 40% of dialysis patients. Mortality is very high if you're a dialysis patient with coronary disease. The two-year mortality rates among dialysis patients are about 48% if you've had a cardiac stent placed and 43% after bypass surgery. And the annual mortality rates from arrhythmia is about 9% after cardiac stent placement and 7% after bypass surgery. Left ventricular hypertrophy is also another risk factor for sudden cardiac death in dialysis patients. So it's defined as thickening of the wall of the heart, and it's prevalent in up to 75% of dialysis patients. Many causes, including hypertension and anemia, and it significantly alters the structure and function of the heart. So if you look at this photomicrograph, um, you know, the, the heart with left ventricular hypertrophy is way bigger and way thicker than a normal heart. But if you look at it on the microscopic level, there is a lot of scar tissue present inside of the hypertrophied ventricle. Um, and uh, likely there is a diminished tolerance for reduced blood supply. The long weekend in between dialysis treatments is another important risk factor for sudden cardiac death among dialysis patients. The risk of sudden cardiac death is highest around the first hemodialysis session of the week. So Monday for a Monday, Wednesday, Friday patient and Tuesday for a Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday patient. Specifically, the risk of sudden cardiac death is threefold higher in the 12 hours before the end of the long weekend interval. Interestingly, it's also 1.7 fold higher in the 12 hours starting with dialysis after the long weekend. So why the higher risk? Probably due to electrolyte abnormalities, particularly potassium. After the long weekend and before dialysis starts, most patients have high potassium or hyperkalemia. But after dialysis, because dialysis is so efficient at rapidly removing potassium from the blood, patients are at risk for low potassium or hypokalemia, which is also arrhythmogenic. Another risk factor for sudden cardiac death is so-called dialysis vintage, or how many years a patient has been on dialysis. From data looking at the United States Renal Data System cohort, um, dialysis patients in this country between 1995 and 1999, the rates of sudden cardiac death increase with number of years on dialysis. So if you've been on dialysis for two years, your risk of sudden cardiac death is 93 out of 1,000 patient years. Five years, it's almost double that. Jadul published a prospective observational study in almost 38,000 dialysis patients from 930 dialysis facilities and identified the following risk factors regarding the dialysis prescription. A low potassium, low calcium bath was associated with sudden cardiac death. If you use anything less than a 2K bath, you have twice the risk of sudden cardiac death. If you remove a lot of fluid in one treatment, 
That's also associated with increased sudden cardiac death, as is treatment time less than 3.5 hours or a low KTRV, which is a measure of how well we are cleaning the blood. Medications can also increase the risk of sudden cardiac death, and the proposed mechanism is a prolongation of something called the QT interval. The QT interval is the time it takes for the electrical system to fire an impulse through the ventricles and then recharge. That is, it's time for the heart muscle to contract and then recover. Greater than 480 milliseconds is associated with an increased risk of ventricular fibrillation. There are many medications that prolong the QT interval. These include antibiotics such as levofloxacin, ciprofloxacin, erythromycin, Bactrim, fluconazole, psychiatric medications such as sertraline, lithium, and trazodone, pain medications such as amitriptyline, nortriptyline, methadone, cardiac medications such as amiodarone, among many others. Uh, another commonly used one in dialysis unit is Zofran. Uh, and a lot of these medications are used in combination with one another which further increases the risk. Another cardiac medication that can increase the risk of sudden cardiac death in dialysis patients is digoxin. Digoxin is a medicine that's often used for atrial fibrillation. It's also used as an inotrope for people with reduced uh, heart function or systolic heart failure. Um, and when used in dialysis patients who have a pre-dialysis serum potassium of less than 4.3, it increases the risk of sudden cardiac death. That risk is lower if their serum potassium before dialysis is greater than 4.6. Digoxin, by the way, is from the foxglove plant, which is a flower endemic to the temperate regions of Europe, but which is naturalized to the United States and is grown in many yards of the Pacific Northwest. Let's now shift gears and discuss the clinical management of sudden cardiac death. People outside of the medical profession often have an inflated impression of the survival from out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And oftentimes this comes from having watched television shows. On television, someone has a cardiac arrest, people pump on the chest, and the next scene the patient is sitting up talking with detectives. In 1996, a New England Journal of Medicine study showed that two-thirds of victims survive cardiac arrest on television shows. But in the real world, less than 8% of people survive out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. It's much lower than on television. There is an exception to that, however, and that exception is in dialysis units, where 30 to 50% of patients survive out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Why in the world would survival be high, so high for such a sick population? It's because dialysis units have automated external defibrillators, or AEDs. Uh, as you all know, these are portable electronic devices that automatically diagnose ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia and then administer electrical current. Uh, so it applies electrical therapy, which stops the arrhythmia and allows the heart to reestablish an effective rhythm. AEDs are most effective in ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia and they are available in every dialysis unit. They are more important than stopping dialysis, disconnecting the needles, getting the patient to the floor, starting CPR. The success of AEDs depends primarily on how quickly defibrillation is performed. 20 years ago, I think the significance and utility of AEDs was not fully appreciated uh, in the medical community, including dialysis units. There was a study published by Davis at the University of Washington of Northwest Kidney Center units in 2008 reported that the AED was attached prior to EMS arrival in only 50% of dialysis patients with sudden cardiac death in centers where the AED was available. Now I think we have a much better appreciation and understanding of AEDs uh, and the goal should be 100% of our patients who have a cardiac arrest should have an AED applied before the medics arrive. For patients at high risk of sudden cardiac death, cardiologists have the option of placing an implantable cardiac defibrillator, basically have an AED attached inside of them all the time in case they have a cardiac arrest. Should we use them more in dialysis patients? Implantable cardiac defibrillators are very useful for primary prevention of sudden cardiac death in the general non-dialysis population. A meta-analysis published in 2015 by Woods looked at 4,300 patients from six randomized trials comparing 
defibrillators, implantable defibrillators with just medical therapy for primary prevention of sudden cardiac death and resulted in a 29% reduction in overall mortality compared with standard medical therapy. So what about using implantable defibrillators for primary prevention of sudden cardiac death in the dialysis population? Well, this is one study published in 2015 of 108 dialysis patients receiving primary prevention implantable cardiac defibrillators um, compared with 195 controls. And they looked at data from the National Cardiovascular Data Implantable Cardiac Defibrillator Registry. The study looked at both one and three year survival and unfortunately found no difference in survival at one year and no difference in survival at three years. So unlike the general population, defibrillators, implantable defibrillators do not appear to be useful as primary prevention. So people who have never had a sudden cardiac death but are at risk for one. Chikima published a study in June of 2019, prospective randomized controlled trial of 200 dialysis patients with a left ventricular ejection fraction of 35% or above, half of whom were randomized to defibrillator placement. And they looked at the rates of sudden cardiac death as well as all cause mortality, as well as complications associated with defibrillator placement. What they found was no difference in five year survival, but there were 25 adverse events related to ICD placement. So in conclusion, while automated external defibrillators in the dialysis units are very useful for successful treatment of a sudden cardiac death in a dialysis patient, placement of an implantable cardiac defibrillator is not associated with survival benefit when used for primary prevention of mortality. It's not exactly clear why this case, but dialysis patients have many factors that increase their risk of mortality. So let's summarize what we've learned. Sudden cardiac death is 30 times more likely to occur in dialysis patients than in the general population. There are many risk factors for sudden cardiac death in dialysis patients, including the dialysis prescription. Approximately 70% of cases are caused by ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia. The most important intervention that you all have at your disposal if a dialysis patient has an arrest in a dialysis unit is the automated external defibrillator. Uh, and thus far, studies have failed to demonstrate benefit to prophylactic defibrillator placement for the primary prevention of sudden cardiac death in dialysis patients. Time for the monthly quiz. Question number one, what percentage of dialysis patients die from sudden cardiac death? That's right, 30%. So this is a problem of huge proportion for dialysis patients. Question number two, what is the most common arrhythmia in dialysis patients at the time of cardiac arrest? That's right ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia. And that's why defibrillators are so useful for dialysis patients who suffer a cardiac arrest. Question number three, on what days of the week do dialysis patients most often have a cardiac arrest? Correct. Monday if their Monday was a Friday schedule or Tuesday if they're a Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday schedule. Remember that that risk extends not just before dialysis, but also for the 12 hours after the dialysis treatment. Uh, again, likely related to changes in electrolytes, particularly potassium, high potassium before dialysis and low potassium after dialysis, both of which are arrhythmogenic. What medications can prolong the QT interval and therefore increase the risk of cardiac arrest? <laughs> 
antibiotics such as levofloxacin, ciprofloxacin, fluconazole, pain medications, methadone, amitriptyline, nortriptyline, antidepressants, sertraline, lithium, trazodone, among many others. And final question, do implantable cardiac defibrillators reduce the risk of sudden cardiac death in dialysis patients? And the answer is unfortunately not. So they are not useful for primary prevention of sudden cardiac death, but always remember that the automated external defibrillators are of critical importance uh, for dialysis patients who have an arrest, particularly at our units. This concludes the January 2024 in-service for the Northwest Kidney Center. Again, a special thanks to the wonderful staff of the Kent Northwest Kidney Center unit for successfully resuscitating a patient in our parking lot uh, earlier this month. Thank you for all of the other care that you provide for our patients. Uh, this is Annie Brokenbro signing out until next month.